It has become a dogma of progressive ideology that America is a secular nation. What do people mean by secular? Robert P. George is no joke when it comes to political philosophy. He's holding a PhD from Oxford, and he's a professor at Princeton University. He was named 2009 most influential conservative thinker in the United States and was given awards by George W. Bush in 2008. No way am I punching down in this one. But this guy is just wrong about a lot of stuff. The argument goes this way. Since the Constitution establishes a strict separation of church and state, religion has no place in how the country is to be governed. Religion is a purely private matter and therefore must be kept out of politics or public policy making. There is a problem with this claim, however. It's false. What the Constitution actually does when it comes to religion is first, ban religious tests of any sort for public office, that's in Article 6, and second, forbid the enactment of any law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. He's being purposely deceitful by saying this right now because if you actually do know the history, you would know that the Founding Fathers were deist and secularist who wanted to oppose what was happening in Europe with the Catholic Church, the Anglican Church, and Lutheran churches strongholding all of politics and government. This is what it means to be secular. And he's arguing for, they didn't exactly want to take away the church and state and separate them. He's saying that they wanted to protect churches from being discriminated against by the government, which is only one half what the Constitution actually tries to do. Those are the words of the First Amendment. The plain meaning of those words is that Congress was forbidden from, one, establishing a national church on the model of the Church of England, and two, attempting to disestablish or interfering with the established churches that existed in some of the states, in certain cases for decades after ratification of the First Amendment. What he just did was point to the Constitution. It doesn't say what you think it says, then point to the Constitution where it actually says what we think it says. But what about the separation of church and state? That's in the Constitution too, isn't it? Well, no. Try as you might, you will not find the words separation of church and state in the Constitution. This is bullshit right here. So some things are just implied. For example, the Bible doesn't say anything about there being a trinity. But he's a Catholic, so I'm sure he would admit that the Bible says there's a trinity. But there's nowhere in the Bible to say God is a trinity. The trinity concept comes a lot later. Even 1 John 5, where it says that there's three bear record. This is a later interpolation by the Catholic Church. When the Texas Receptus was being put together, Rasmussen was forced to put this in there, even though he knew that none of these were part of any of the ancient Greek manuscripts. Even the closest verse to implying a trinity is a later adaption. But if you ask Robert P. George how he interprets the Bible, he would tell you that there is a trinity, that God is three. However, it doesn't say that. It's implied. This is what we're talking about when we talk about the Constitution pushing secularism. Just because it doesn't actually say separation of church and state doesn't mean it's not implied. The famous phrase comes from a letter that Thomas Jefferson, who was not at the Constitutional Convention, he was in France at the time, wrote years later to a Baptist community in Danbury, Connecticut. Jefferson, in his characteristically eloquent way, was simply trying to capture the spirit of the First Amendment prohibiting the establishment of a national religion. The author of the Declaration of Independence was committed to an America where people were free to practice any faith or no faith as their consciences dictate. Just simply trying to capture the spirit. Absolutely false. Because Thomas Jefferson was in France because those were our allies at the time. The French liberals were helping United States fighting against the monarchies the religious church-run stronghold of Europe. In many ways, France helped us get our independence from England. They've brought troops over here to help us fight. This is why Jefferson was in France. Thomas Jefferson was the trade commissioner between the United States and France, holding an extremely important position at the time. He was made foreign minister of Paris. Like I said, we would not be a free nation without France. France was the one that actually led the spearhead of liberal freedom 
against the monarchy and the religious theocracy that destroyed Europe for a thousand years. None of the founding fathers, including Jefferson, who was among the least religious of them, though not an atheist, ever entertained the idea that there was to be a separation of religion from public life or from politics. James Madison, religion and government will both exist in great purity, the less they are mixed together. The purpose of separation of church and state is to keep forever from those shores the ceaseless strife that has soaked the soil of Europe in blood for centuries. The true question is not whether religion is necessary, it is whether religious establishments are necessary for religion. The answer is no. During the almost 15 centuries has the legal establishment of Christianity been on trial. What has been its fruits? More or less in all places pride and indolence in the clergy, ignorance and servility in the lady, and both superstition, bigotry, and persecution. Well, he's asking, what is Christianity's fruits? Well, let me lay this out for you. And I know he knows this, but since he's a conservative ideologue, he will never admit this. But I know he's a PhD holder and a, and a professor who's very smart and probably smarter than me, probably higher IQ than me, but which makes it even more appalling that he won't admit this. Epicurus, 341 to 270 BC a Greek philosopher and scientist who came up with the theory of atoms. In the same time period as Plato's forms, the metaphysical world, you have Epicurus making true theories about atomic theory. This is where we were at back then, in a time before Christianity, in a time of paganism. I think it's good to also point out that during this time, Athens had a strong democracy and there was constitutional republics all over Greece. Well, they didn't need Judeo-Christianity for that. We think we need to thank them for this, not Judeo-Christian values. So in no way, shape or form does the Christian led Europe have any credibility or should be credited for anything that happened in the success of humanity. In fact, when the enlightenment came around, this was a move from theocracy and now look at the world. I'm sure a lot of uh, conservatives are saying the world's horrible. The world's been, the world's been crazy horrible since liberals took over. But those are the same people that push constitutional republics, which was a liberal movement led by France and the United States. You would get your head chopped off your body if you said, I want to be a pagan. Not only that, even if you wanted to be a different kind of Christian than what the church had in store for you. Your head is coming off your body. And this is the type of theocracy that Mr. George wants to put in place. Alexander Hamilton was a Christian who said he believed in it as true. In politics, as in religion, it is equally absurd to aim at making proselytes by fire and sword. Heresies in either can be rarely cured by persecution, pointing to the thousand years of persecuting people for heresy. The world has been scourged with many fanatical sects in religion, who, inflamed by sincere but mistaken zeal, have perpetuated under the idea of serving God the most atrocious crimes. What is he talking about? He's talking about people killing other people in the name of their religion. This is what church and separation of church and state means. He was a pious Christian. I'm, I'm going to point this out. I'm going to be very fair with you. Yeah, Hamilton was a Christian. But he also knew to separate his own beliefs to the government. It is nowhere in the Constitution does it say Jesus or Yahweh or Allah. It just has the word God. Because that is an outside abstract idea that nobody can conquer. That these, these God-given laws. It actually makes sense, especially in the time period we're talking about. Now, you look up George Washington in Google Images quotes on the religion. You're going to see a whole plethora of quotes that never are not found in any of his journals or anywhere. Who knows who put those on there? But if you actually look into the journals of George Washington, he is very anti-Christianity, very anti-Catholic Catholic Church, very anti-Judeo-Christian itself. He wrote an entire plethora of letters to all the churches explaining the situation that they would be protected by the Constitution. 
In fact, George Washington was a Freemason. The name of Jesus Christ is not mentioned even once in the vast collection of George Washington's letters. He never said his name. So if he really was a Christian, that's a really bad Christian. Sorry. John Adams thought that the doctrine of the Trinity was a lunatic idea. He also said that the divinity of Jesus was not true, and he was just a man that he never actually resurrected. I almost shudder at the thought of alluding to the most fatal example of the abuses of grief, which the history of mankind has preserved, the cross. Consider what calamities that engine of grief has produced. Yeah, this is this is what he, he wants, a, a Christian nation, yeah. Burning people at the stake for a thousand years for just wanting to have a different religion than Christianity. That's what we need in America. Thomas Jefferson. It is not to be understood that I am with him in all his doctrines. I am a materialist. He takes the side of spiritualism. He preaches the efficiency of repentance towards forgiveness of sin. I require counterpoise of good works to redeem it. Thomas Jefferson. We discover in the Gospels a groundwork of vulgar ignorance, of things impossible, of superstition, fanaticism, and fabrication. Thomas Jefferson, among the sayings and discourses imputed by, to him by his biographers, I find many passages of fine imagination, correct morality, and the most lovely benevolence, and others. Again, so much ignorance, so much absurdity, so much untruth, charlatanism, and imposture as to pronounce it impossible that such contradictions should have proceeded from the same being. Sounds pretty Gnostic to ask me. I separate therefore the gold from the dross, restore him to the former, and leave the latter to the stupidity of some, the roguery of others of his disciples, of this band of dupes and impostors. Paul was the great Corypheus and the first corrupter of the doctrines of Jesus. Hmm. No wonder why Mr. George wanted to separate Thomas Jefferson. He wasn't even in the meeting. <laughs> it is not trying to go there, I guess. Thomas Jefferson. Jesus did not mean to impose himself on mankind as the son of God. Physically speaking, I have been convinced by the writings of men more learned than myself in the lore. Yeah, Christian nation, right? The truth, Thomas Jefferson, the truth that the greatest enemies of the doctrine of Jesus are those who have perverted them to the structure of system of fancy, absolutely incomprehensible and without any foundation in his genuine words. And the day will come when the mystical generations of Jesus, by the supreme being as his father, in the womb of a virgin, will be classed with the fable of the generation of Minerva in the brain of Jupiter. Myth. He's right. They are myth. I am an Epicurean. I consider the member of Epicurus, who I just mentioned, as being theorizing atomic theory in the 400s BC, back when constitutional republics and democracy were running rampant in the West, without Christianity, without Judeo-Christian values. They had all this stuff already. They had science, they had freedom, they had liberty. Thomas Jefferson quoting saying, I am an Epicurean. I consider the genuine, not the imputed, doctrines of Epicurus as containing everything rational and moral philosophy which the Greek and Roman leave us. So this is not Judeo-Christian values. This is Greco-Paganism values, if you want to really take it that, to that level. That's not really what it is. It's human value. It's true. It's common sense. Being good to people. That's what this is. It has nothing to do with a higher power. That's not what this is. It's just common sense. Thomas Paine. The fable of Jesus Christ as told in the New Testament and the wild visionary doctrine raised therein against which I contend. The story taking it as told as blasphemy of seen. It is the fable. Fable of Christ and his 12 apostles is a parody of the sun and the 12 signs of the zodiac, copied from the ancient religions of the Eastern world. Everything told of Christ's reference of the sun, his reported resurrection is the sunrise, and the first day of the week, that is, on the day anciently dedicated to the sun, and from thence called Sunday. Now, Roger Sherman was a Bible-believing Christian. He was a fundamentalist Christian, and this is what he has to say. Congress has no power to make any religious establishments. Zero. This is a guy who is a completely fundamentalist Christian, Bible-believing Christian, who is understanding that Congress has no power to make any religious establishments. That means no schools. That means no 
teaching garbage to kids. That means not forcing religion on the population. Coming from probably more of a believer than most of, than probably you are. William Penn says, to have religion upon authority, not upon conviction, is like a finger watch to be set forwards or backwards as he pleases that has it in keeping. George Mason, all men have an equal, natural, and unalienable right to the free exercise of religion, according to the dictates of conscience, and that no particular sect or society of Christians ought to be favored or established by law in preference to others. The sole purpose and effect of it is to exclude persecution, cure the important right of religious liberty. Oliver, Oliver Ellsworth, nowhere in any of these quotes are you hearing anybody say, we need a, a nation that's ruled by God and Christians. Nowhere. Zero. And this is what he's trying to imply in this video. And a lot of his Christian followers are probably getting that message. The secularist claim that our constitution consigns religion to the purely private sphere is contradicted by the words and actions of the greatest figures in American history. From Washington, who called for national days of prayer, to Lincoln, who proclaimed a national day of prayer and fasting, to Martin Luther King. King, of course, was the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, a Baptist clergyman who fought racial segregation and discrimination in the most explicitly biblical terms. So this is completely misleading. What he did was he took three people from a span of 200 years and gave an example of wanting a day of prayer, wanting a prayer breakfast, and somebody who happens to be a reverend and saying, look, our history is filled with people who were Christians who wanted to put Christianity in government. Martin Luther King also said a religion that gives nothing, costs nothing, and suffers nothing is worth nothing. The church must be reminded that it is not the master or the servant of the state, but rather the conscience of the state. It must be the guide, not the critic of the state, and never its tool. 1963, Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, from a perspective of someone who is a Bible-believing Christian, to come out and say, look, we can use this as a moral compass, but it could not be the judge. Directly opposes what you're trying to imply here. If you believe the secularist understanding of the separation of church and state, Martin Luther King violated that doctrine in almost everything he did. And so did every president in American history. Every single one invoked God in his inaugural address. Like, this guy is, does not like Joe Biden, right? This guy would probably say Joe Biden is the Antichrist or something. You know, he has probably a whole lot of crazy stuff to say about Joe Biden. Joe Biden invoked God in his inaugural address. This is what presidents do. Knowing that most of our country is a Christian nation, most people practice some sort of Christianity, Catholicism, some sort of Baptist church they go to in their family. Isn't it kind of obvious that a president would invoke the word God in their inaugural address? The major thing that he's not telling you is that the inaugural address is not about God. It's just a word that's put in there to sort of spice things up a little bit. As if he's saying that every single president that got into office wanted this to be a theocracy. Wanted this to be a Christian Judeo nation. That's what he's implying and it's completely nonsense. For Martin Luther King as for so many other Americans, racial injustice was not only a violation of the golden rule but first and foremost, a violation of the teaching of the book of Genesis that every human being is made in the image and likeness of God. So first of all, the golden rule predates Christianity. It goes back to Buddhist Confucius teachings that are taught in that realm. He's referencing the golden rule. He's insisting that this has to be from the book of Matthew or something like that. When it's not, the golden rule is a universal thing. You treat people how you want to be treated. And then it goes against Genesis. Genesis is the, is the only place where we get that from, that everyone is equal under the eyes of God. Again, it's not where that comes from. This is just common sense, and he's just throwing in these lame arguments. of God. There are in the world truly secularist regimes. France, with its system of laicite, religion must be exercised only in the private, not the public sphere, is one. So, of course, are the communist regimes of China, Cuba, and North Korea. In such regimes, secularism is the official public philosophy, and religion is, to the extent it is permitted at all, restricted to the private domain. Yeah, and that is also what we were just talking about in the Constitution 
and the people that wrote the Constitution. That is exactly what we have here. In fact, the United States itself was sort of inspired by the French Revolution. Religion in America is in the private domain. Secularism is not what causes tyranny. If a tyrant happens to be secular, it has nothing to do with why he's a tyrant. Those are two separate things. It's like if I took all the popes in history, all the Roman emperors, and said, look, they were all Christians, therefore Christianity made them tyrants. I can make the same straw man argument. In fact, this straw man argument might not even be a straw man argument. There might be some truth behind it because for a thousand years, as I keep mentioning in this video, you had popes, Roman emperors, and kings in the name of Christianity chopping people's heads off for choosing the wrong faith or being a heretic. And you want to point to China and North Korea as communist dictatorships and say, it's because they're secular that they're like this. Nonsense. But that is not an accurate description of the United States at all. And how could it be? Although we separate the institutions of religion from those of government, we do that not to make religion subservient to the state, but rather to protect it from the state. You're wrong again. Yes, it is. Nobody is at all forced to comply with your religious views. Just because a president says the word God in their inaugural address does not mean that we're a Judeo-Christian nation. Like I said before, constitutional republics, democracy, are from ancient Greece. They don't come from the Bible. Which part of Deuteronomy or Numbers or Leviticus or in uh, the book of Timothy where it says that women should cover their head and women can't be leaders in the church, which part of that do you see in the Constitution? We are, after all, a nation which, in its very founding document, acknowledges the Creator, God Himself, as the source of justice owed to all human beings. <laughs> Funny enough that the symbol for justice is an ancient symbol for the God of Athens. That's where I was just talking about. The Greeks are the ones that brought us all these ideas. That is from Greece! We ju I just mentioned this, and he just shows it in his own video. He just debunked himself completely that the idea of justice predates Christianity, predates the Bible, and goes back to the time of the Epicureans, the Stoics, and the pagans of ancient Greece. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, and among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Far from being secularist, the American constitutional order holds that our fundamental rights are not privileges conferred by any merely human power. Notice how it says their creator, which is implying that they have their own choice of who their creator can be. It doesn't have to be Judeo-Christian. I'm, I'm sure if you ask him, hey, what do you think about people being Buddhists in America? What if we all think about teaching Buddhism in classrooms? He would probably say, no, we shouldn't do that. What about teaching Islam in classroom? No, how, oh no, we should not do that. But Judeo-Christianity, oh yeah, we should teach that in school. They are rather gifts, endowments from God himself. And they are unalienable. That is, they cannot legitimately be taken away by government or any other human authority, precisely because they were not given to us by any human authority. Indeed, we couldn't give them away even if we wanted to. Why? Because they come from the hand of God. Again, it's an abstract idea. It's easy to agree upon. If you're making a constitution and the rights come from God as an abstract idea, you're saying that they're above us. They're above government. They're above a judge or a, a, a business owner who has billions of dollars. It's an abstract idea. That's what that is. So is the claim that America is a secular nation true? The answer should now be clear. I'm Robert George, McCormick Professor of Jurisprudence and Director of the James Madison Program at Princeton University for Prager University. Complete nonsense. I hope that you at least saw where I'm coming from in the contrast of what he's trying to pull over your eyes. You have just attained true gnosis. You have just attained true gnosis. The Demiurge has no power over you. Jesus.